from James chapter 4. Why do you fight and argue among yourselves? Isn't it because of your sinful longings? They fight inside you. You want something, but you can't get it. You kill and want what others have, but you can't have what you want. You argue and fight. You don't have what you want because you don't ask God. When you do ask for something, you don't receive it. Why? Because you ask for the wrong reason. You want to spend your money on your sinful pleasures. You are not faithful to God. Don't you know that to be a friend of the world is to hate God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Don't you know what scripture says? The spirit that God caused to live in us wants us to belong only to God. Don't you think scripture has a reason for saying that? God continues to give us more grace. That's why scripture said, God opposes those who are proud, but he gives grace to those who are not. So obey God, stand up to the devil. He will run away from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Make your hearts pure, you who can't make up your minds. Be full of sorrow, cry and sob. Change your laughter to crying. Change your joy to sadness. Bow down to the Lord. He will lift you up. My brothers and sisters, don't speak against one another. Anyone who speaks against another believer speaks against the law. And anyone who judges another believer judges the law. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it. Instead, you are acting as if you were its judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge. He is the one who is able to save life or destroy it. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Kathy. That was incredible. That was awesome. Uh, good morning, City Light. How are you guys? Yeah, that's awesome. My name's Doug, one of the pastors here. And um, hey, I want to start with a little history lesson this morning. And I promise it's interesting because it's about rednecks in the backwoods of Kentucky. Okay? About 150 years ago, in the 1860s, while our nation was engaged in a bloody civil war, there was a smaller war going on, this time between two families, the Hatfields and the McCoys. The Hatfields and the McCoys, they lived along the border between Kentucky and West Virginia, and for decades, they got along just fine. Everything was, was okay. But in the 1860s, something blew up between them, and nobody's really for sure how it got started. Was it over a land dispute? Were the patriarchs of the family in disagreement? No one's really for sure, but things blew up. And at first, there were like raids on one another's property, you know, threaten, threats and shouting matches at the local saloons, things like that. But eventually, it escalated into full-blown war. There were houses that were burned down. There was property that was stolen. There were people who were um, killed and in prison. Like a Hatfield would kill a McCoy, and then a McCoy would go in prison or capture a Hatfield and put him in like a schoolhouse as a prison, but then actually go ahead and kill him whenever he said he was going to release him. Some of their children fell in love and married, which made things even more complicated because then there would be a Hatfield who also wanted to kill a Hatfield. So over the course of 30 years, things escalated so much. Property was stolen, livestock was destroyed, threats were made, lives were taken to the point that 12 Hatfields and McCoys were murdered. It was conflict at its worst. Just terrible conflict and murder among them. And now, I've never been involved in a feud quite like that. But for as long as I can remember, I've had relational conflict in my life. Growing up, I would argue with my parents, or I'd argue with my brother. Uh, whenever I'd be playing in soccer games, I'd get mad, and I'd start pushing and shoving and trash talking. And now, even as a grown adult, I still have arguments or fighting. I still have conflict in marriage, in parenting, having to be on staff with Chris Haruska. <laughs> I'm kidding. 
I'm kidding. It's great being on staff with Chris. But relational conflict is just, it's common in my life. And I would guess that it's also common in your life. If you just think of maybe the, the three closest relationships or friendships that you have, I'd bet that probably in the last couple of months, you've had conflict in at least one of those just in the last couple of months. Conflict is so common. Some of you are even in conflict this morning, like Gavin said, right? You're sitting next to each other. You're throwing the elbow, writing nasty notes to each other. He's going to preach at you today, <laughs> smiling like nothing's going on. I've been there. I've done that before. Conflict is really common which is why I'm so glad that the Bible actually has something to say about conflict. God actually addresses conflict. And one of the passages in the Bible where God helps us understand conflict, deal with conflict, and understand how dangerous conflict is, is right before us today in James chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to James chapter 4. Now while you turn there, let me just warn you. James wrote this, okay? And by now, you've probably picked up on the fact that James doesn't really pull any punches. As Chris has said a couple of times, James doesn't flirt with us on the first date. Instead, he's more like a linebacker who's pursuing the quarterback, and he just hopes that we have our helmets on. That's James, right? So put in your mouth guard, get a drink of water, and here we go. Verse 1, James starts with the presenting problem. He starts with the presenting problem, and he puts it in the form of a question. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Quarrels and fights. You've got them. I've got them. They're everywhere. You've got them at school, at work, at home, with your family, with your friends. And as he's saying, you even got quarrels and fights in church, in your city group, with someone sitting in this room. There's quarrels and fights everywhere. Sometimes these quarrels and fights are big. Sometimes they're little. Sometimes the fights are painless. Other times, they're absolutely brutal. Sometimes you laugh your way out of conflict. Sometimes you cry your way out of conflict. Conflict is so common. Argument, fighting, bickering, complaining, yelling. Others fight through silence. Defending and distance. Text messages or Facebook messages. Emotional hurt, physical hurt, and like the Hatfields and McCoys, sometimes that even escalates to murder. Conflict is common. But conflict is only the presenting problem. It is not the real issue. Okay, now let me say that again. If you catch that, it is so helpful. Conflict is only the presenting problem. It is not the real issue. Just like if you were sick and you had a high fever, that fever isn't the real issue. It's just a symptom, okay? Similarly, your conflicts that are going on, they aren't the real issue. They're just a symptom of something else that is going on inside. That's why in verse 1, James doesn't spend a lot of time trying to analyze details and get to the bottom of things and, you know, figure out who said what, when, where, how, why, all that sort of stuff. He doesn't get into that. James doesn't right now, you know, I heard that Bill said to Sue and then Sue kind of twisted the details when she passed it on to Jill and now Jill's husband, Bob, won't go to the game with Joe and Joe's got his feelings hurt and they're kind of mad and they're arguing. He doesn't get into all those details. He doesn't try to get to the bottom of it when it comes to details. And the reason why is that conflict is only the presenting problem. Therefore, James's question is, what causes quarrels and fights among you? And James's answer to that question in verse 1 gets us to the deeper problem, the deeper problem beneath the presenting problem. So let's go back to verse 1 and read it again. What causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? If you have a Bible and a pen, underline passions and underline within. Let's keep going. Verse 2. You desire and do not have, so you murder. Hatfields and McCoys or gang fights, or domestic disputes taken to the absolute extreme. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Passions 
at war within you. Desires, coveting, that is the deeper problem beneath the conflicts. The passions that are warring within you lead to quarrels and fights around you. Does that make sense? Let me say it a different way. Any argument that you get in with your spouse or roommate or boss or whoever it might be, any argument that you get in, it isn't about whatever particular topic you're arguing about. It's not about that. Instead, it is about the passions that are at war within you. That argument is about those passions. It's a heart problem. It's a passion problem. But the culture around us so often, they don't believe this, and they certainly don't teach us. Instead, our culture, and you and me, if we're honest, believe that conflict isn't that big of a deal. We try to smooth it over just on the surface. We don't get to the heart passions within us. We try to deal with conflict without dealing with our hearts. Let, let me illustrate. I still remember one of the first dates that Whitney, Whitney's my wife, one of the first dates that Whitney and I ever went on. Early on, this is maybe date number two or date number three. Some of you guys are going to hear this and wonder why wasn't it the last date. But I told Whitney, hey, I'll be there at 6 o'clock. And in the family that I grew up in, 6 o'clock means 5.55, okay? On time means get there early. So I showed up at 5.55, and she wasn't ready yet. She was still inside, like, doing her hair, putting on makeup, like, making sure the outfit matches, making me wait, the gall of such a woman. <laughs> and, and at first, now, hey, you got to give me a little grace, because I was just young, dumb, and immature, okay? At first, I just sat outside in the car and just kind of stewed around a little bit. Then I went inside and paced around in the kitchen, right? Some of you guys are like, why wasn't this the last date? That night, I was just grumpy. We got in an argument, and Whitney made it very clear that grumpiness was not going to be cool in our relationship, okay? So that's the presenting problem, right? I was being grumpy, and we got in an argument. But I just tried to downplay it, pretend like it's not that big of a deal. I tried to deal with the conflict without dealing with my heart. You know, just make a few adjustments. It's, it's just a personality difference. It's just difference in families of origin, right? It's, it's just a little difference between how we understand time. I dealt with the conflict without dealing with my heart. So guess what happened the next time? I was nice. I was, I was great. I wasn't grumpy. Guess what happened the next time? Right back to grumpy. Right back to upset because I never dealt with the passions at war within me. The, the, the conflict is only the presenting problem. What's really happening are these passions that are at war within you. Have you ever done that, what I did? Where you tried to deal with a conflict without dealing with your heart? Just make some adjustments, try harder, do better, and then you think, voila, it'll all go away, right? You and your spouse like are having problems, you're at odds, and you think, oh, just get some communication techniques, and everything will be better. Or you and your boss can't get along, and so you think, well, I just need to tell him this is how it is. Or you get angry at your kids, and you start barking at them, and so you think, okay, count to 10, take a deep breath, and everything will be better. Make some adjustments, try harder, do better. Have you ever done that? Did it work? Maybe. Maybe it worked for a short time, but those things, those things can be great. They can be helpful only if you have first dealt with the deeper problem, the deeper problem of the passions at war within us. You have longings and lust for um, power or control or sex or money or a certain relationship or your image or prestige or comfort or whatever it might be. And it is those passions that are driving your conflicts. Your cravings underlie your conflicts. Your cravings inside underlie your conflicts outside. So try this. We're just going to do some real live application here, okay? Think back to the last time that you got mad or the last time that you got in an argument, okay? Get that in your head. Now ask yourself this question. What was it that I wanted so badly that I was willing to argue about it? 
that I was willing to fight about it? What was it that I wanted so bad that I would even say hurtful things or do hurtful things to get it? What was it? And you might answer, I just wanted the dadgum remote control if she'd hurry up and give it to me. Or you might answer, I just wanted him to notice me. Okay, th those are great starts. Now let's just go a little deeper beneath that surface. Why is that remote control so important to you? Why must you have it? Or why is it so crucial to you that he notices you in that time? Why is that so important? Maybe, right, these are just hypothetical examples. Maybe you wanted the remote control because you wanted some sense of power. Or you wanted to feel independent from the others around you. Or maybe you really wanted him to notice you so that you could have a good feeling inside, a feeling of acceptance. Or you wanted to wield some sense of influence against or towards another purpose, another person. Do you see how when you start asking these questions, when you start digging a little deeper, there's more than meets the eye. There's passions that are warring within you, and those passions drive your conflicts. These passions inside us are so strong that we will even pray to get more of them. Maybe you've done this too. It'd be like me praying after my date night with Whitney um, where I, when I was grumpy. It'd be like if I started praying, I was like, Father in heaven, mm, you are so good. You are perfect. You are righteous. And oh, Father in heaven, I just praise you because you are always on time. You are just always on time. You are never late, God, never. Oh, most gracious heavenly Father, mm, glory to you on high. I just pray that Whitney would be more like you. <laughs> Could you just make her more like you, right? I mean, we laugh, but you've done it too, surely. Hopefully I'm not the only one in the room. We will pray to get those passions met. We will ask God to manipulate others so that our cravings will be met in our conflicts. We'll start asking him to manipulate others so that we can get our cravings. James says it this way in verse 2. He says, you do not have because you do not ask, which is why we start praying, right? Our yelling or our silence or our fit throwing didn't quite work, so we resort to prayer. But James goes on in verse 3. He says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And so there's the word again, passions. It's these passions and cravings and longings and lust that will drive us to conflict. These passions and cravings will drive us to try to manipulate God himself. These passions and cravings will drive us to steal from, kill, and even destroy one another in our conflicts. So the question is, what is yours? What is it that you long for that you will go toe-to-toe -to -toe any day? Is it your honor? Is it your comfort? Is it your family? Is it your image or your achievements? Is it your beauty? What is it that you crave? That is the deeper problem beneath your conflicts. That's the deeper problem beneath your conflicts. But surprisingly, it isn't the deepest problem. Right, conflict is the presenting problem. These passions at war within us are deeper, but James isn't done yet, right? We're only three verses into this. He still has more to say. He's going to take us to the deepest problem. Remember, James is the linebacker chasing the quarterback, hoping that we have our helmets on. So James keeps on going to get to the deepest problem to level the blow. So hang with me. Here we go. Verse 4. I'm just reading the scriptures, okay? Verse 4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. 
Or do you just suppose it is to no purpose that Scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Bam! The linebacker just sacked us. We are on the ground eating grass and our mouthpiece just fell out. A few minutes ago, you thought you just wanted to be on time or you thought you just wanted the remote control and now James is saying you make yourself an enemy of God. This is scary. This is serious. Your deepest problem is conflict with God. Your deepest problem is conflict with God. As much as we want the issue to be just between us and someone else, James says that the real issue is between us and God. We have a God problem. If you keep biting back at your spouse, you have a God problem. If you keep getting angry and yelling at the kids, you have a God problem. If you keep arguing and getting mad at a coworker, you have a God problem. If your roommate always annoys you and so you pretend like she doesn't exist, you have a God problem. God calls you an adulterer, an enemy of him, and you've made yourself that way by pursuing the satisfaction of these cravings in someone or something other than him. It's scary and it's serious. God is longing for you. He yearns jealously for you. He's put his creative spirit inside you, and he refuses to share you with some lesser than craving that you keep trying to get satisfied in someone else or something else, and that always leads to conflict. So your craving for control that always leads you to get angry with your spouse, that makes God jealous. Or your craving for perfection that always leads you to criticize every person around you, that makes God jealous. God has passions. God has longings. God has yearnings. And he wants you. So no matter how much we want our issue to be just between us and someone else, we can't accept that. We have a God problem. Your conflict is ultimately with God. Because these cravings that we have, we go somewhere else to get them met instead of going to him. And that always leads to conflict. Now, I know this sounds bizarre to go from I wanted the remote control to suddenly I'm an enemy of God. But if we can realize this, if we'll accept this, it is so incredibly helpful. When you believe that your deepest problem is with your spouse you're going to keep going to your spouse to fix it. But he or she can't. They just can't. Or if you think your deepest problem is with your teacher or professor or child or parent or roommate or whomever it might be, you will keep going to them expecting them to fix it. But they can't. They just can't. Because your deepest problem isn't with them. It is with God. Therefore, we must go to God with our conflicts and draw from him, learn from him. Some of you have a history of broken relationships, burned bridges, and gruesome grudges because you keep thinking that your deepest problem is always them. No. Your deepest problem is conflict with God trying to get your cravings met in someone or something else other than him. So let me illustrate this. Just from a story in my life recently, just a few weeks ago, I had had a long day, lots of meetings, lots of conversations, and I'm an introvert. So as an introvert, if I have a long day of meetings and conversations, I get home exhausted. I'm just tired. And so I got home that day tired. Whitney knows this. She tries to help me out. So later on that night, after all the kids except our infant daughter, after they're in bed, she's just trying to engage me. She's asking, hey, how was the day? How did this go? How did that go? And so I'd give her some updates. I'd share with her some. But anytime she kind of gave any response, I'd be like really edgy and defensive. I'd, I'd like get mad and try to shut the conversation down. Okay? And so Whitney, very wisely, very calmly, she said to me, Doug, 
what's going on? Anytime I try to share with you, I can't win. What's going on inside you, Doug? She knew that the presenting problem was me being short with her, but there was a deeper problem, something inside me. She's a wise woman like that. Right about this time, our infant daughter needed to go to bed. There's bedtime, she needs to get to sleep. So Whitney excuses herself and she goes to put Talitha down. Now usually if that happens, I'll just sit there and stew, right? I'll pull out my self-pity blanket and put that on. Maybe mix in a little self-righteousness. I'll start daydreaming about Whitney coming back out and telling me how I'm the world's best husband and she was so wrong when she kept asking me questions even though I was tired. That's usually what happens, but this time it went differently, thankfully. I pulled out my phone and I started journaling. I do journal on my phone. So I was journaling on my phone and I just want to read to you what I entered into my journal that night, just so you can see how my conflict that night, the deepest conflict was with God, not with Whitney. So let me just read it to you. Father, I feel like I am being mightily used by you, but not close to you. I am working for you, but not enjoying a friendship with you. I need you to do things or lead things or heal my children. They had been sick at that time. Hold Whitney. But I don't love you or like you or enjoy you. I was trying to be honest with them. But I do enjoy what you are doing. I'm amazed by your work. You are totally answering prayers, big time. Prayers for people and church and family. It's just that you seem distant. It feels less personal less fatherly, more nice God-ish. So I began to ask him questions, just trying to listen to the Father in this time. So I said, Father, what needs to change in my life? And of course, I'm hoping he was going to say, my wife. He didn't. <laughs> Father, what needs to change in my life? His answer, you. What needs to change about me? His answer, your heart. What needs to change about my heart? His answer, return to your first love. What is my first love? And the answer, lingering in the Bible long enough to connect with God. Meeting God personally in the Bible. Not teaching someone, not discipling someone, not counseling someone, not leading a team or ministry, not even loving someone, not even loving my wife. My first ever love was loving the God of the Bible. That's what I wrote that night. So you see, you see the presenting problem, right? Me being short because I thought I was a tired introvert. My wife helped me see the deeper problem just by asking the question, what's going on inside you? And I ended up being honest about the deepest problem, that I had distanced myself from God using ministry. That was the deepest problem. So right then and there, I just repented to God said, God, I'm a mess. I've been telling other people to connect with you without me myself connecting with you. I am all sorts of messed up. Will you please help me? And so I was restored to God. And then when my wife came out, I shared the same thing with her and was restored to her. Now, do you know what James would call that experience? Whenever I realized that my deepest conflict was with God, and so I went to God with that conflict, and God actually responded gently and kindly, do you know what James would call that? He calls it grace. That is grace. Look at verse 6, James 4, verse 6. What good news for us when we're in conflict. Here we go. But he gives grace. More, what is it, church? Grace. He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God gave me grace. It was his grace for me to even come to him in the first place. And then he gave me grace to repent and be restored to him first. And after that, to be restored to my wife, second. 
And I thank God that in his grace, in that moment, he cared for me. Because it could have gone the other way. Like I said, sometimes when that happens, I just sit and stew in self-pity. I'll do anything and everything to actually avoid God when I'm in that conflict. I'll try to think of ways to earn back Whitney's favor, think of ways to get out of this conflict, think of ways to stay busy, anything to avoid God. And I would guess that you sometimes do the same thing. You're in a conflict and you try to figure out the conflict or figure out how to just get past it or make things better and you try to stay busy, anything to avoid God. Because he's God, right? Like, we have a chance of maybe winning the conflict with the other person, but, like, you can't win the conflict with God. He's always right in the conflict, right? It's like a junior high kid boxing against Rocky. We know who's going to win that one. He's God, and so we try to avoid him in conflict. But when we avoid God, or we ignore God, or we resist God, that is pride. We are being proud. Are you proud this morning? Have you been proud for a long time, resisting God in your conflicts? If so, I'm going to read James 4, 6 again a little differently, and you need to hear this. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God is opposed to you in your pride. He is opposed to you when you are in your pride. And so your options are really simple. You can stay in your pride. You can resist him. You can avoid him. You can savor your false sense of pride. And he will oppose you. Or this morning, or the next time you're in conflict, you can submit to him. You can lay down your pride and come under him. You can draw near to him. Be close to him. To him, God commands you to cleanse your hands, to purify your heart towards him. God commands you to mourn and weep, to be wretched, to admit that you're a mess. God commands you to get rid of your fake laughter, your, oh, I've got it all together image that you portray, and instead mourn the devastating effects of your prideful sin in your conflicts. God commands you to humble yourself, to get low, to come under him, knowing that when you humble yourself before God, he will give grace, even to the point of exalting you. Incredible promise. When you humble yourself before God, he will give you grace, even to the point of exalting you. And hear this, your ability to exalt yourself in pride stinks compared to God's ability to exalt you in grace. Let me say it differently. God's willingness and his ability to exalt you in his grace is so much better than your ability to exalt yourself in pride in that conflict. Who cares if you win the conflict if you lose the grace of God? So, James 4, 7 through 10, is, the commentators would say it is one of the most pointed, straight, clear, sharp like an arrow calls to repentance in all of the New Testament. And it is aimed, it is not aimed at the humble among us. If you're here this morning, you're like, man, I already know I'm a wreck. I already know I'm messed up. I already know I need help. This isn't aimed at you. It is aimed at those who are in pride, who are two-faced, self-consumed, and God-avoiding among us this morning. So I'm just going to read it. And if you're in pride, Bad part about that is if you're in pride, you're probably blind to it. If you're in pride, you're sitting there probably thinking, oh, I hope she hears this. Oh, I hope he finally gets it and realizes that I'm right. 
So if you're thinking that, here we go. I'm just going to read the passage and let it land. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. It's a promise. When you humble yourself before the Lord, he will exalt you. So to sum it up, conflict is only the presenting problem. We do well to get to the deeper problem, which is those passions that are at war within us. But most of all, we have to get to the deepest problem, which is our conflict with God himself. When we try to satisfy our cravings with someone or something else other than him. Therefore, in your conflict with God, your options are simple this morning. I'm going to give us some time to pray and listen. Your options are simple. Humble yourself. Admit that you've messed it up. Admit that you're wrong, or you could be wrong, and receive grace from him. Receive grace from him, or you can stay in your pride and know that he opposes you there. I urge you, would you receive grace from God this morning? The grace that came at the cost of his son, Jesus Christ, who could have stayed exalted. He could have stayed far away in distance, but instead he humbled himself and even died a sinner's death so that we could be brought near, we could draw near to God. And in God's grace, he will exalt us. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, would you work right now Through your Holy Spirit, would you be working and stirring? Would you be exposing pride in the hearts of some people and and then give them a willingness to lay that down? Most likely, prideful persons, the last thing they want to do is be wretched. The last thing they want to do is admit that they're wrong. But Father, I ask that you would give them grace to see that they're wrong and come to you with their conflict. That's something that I can't do no matter how hard I preach or how loud I yell or how quietly I whisper. It's something that only you can do, God. Would you work in the heart of all of us who are proud this morning, who resist you or ignore you? Would you come and change our hearts? Humble us, God. Humble us before your majesty and glory. Bring us low so that we might know grace. Father, I also pray for the humble among us. God, thank you that there's many among us that are already at a place of knowing we're a wreck, we're a mess, and we are in need. We're in need of your grace. And so, God, I know you're giving it to them already. You're pouring it out on them, letting them experience more of your grace. Minister to the humble this morning. And for the spouses who need to be restored in the next few minutes, for the husbands who need to confess sin and ask for forgiveness, for the wives who need to do that, for the roommates that are at odd with one another, for the city group members who are in conflict right now, God, would you give them a sense of urgency in the next few minutes to go to one another and be restored as they've been restored to you through grace. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Would you come do so much work among us, all the work that we could never imagine. You know each person in this room. Would you work in their hearts? So what we're going to do for the next few minutes, Gabe is just going to play behind us. And I just want you to stay where you are. We're not going to sing yet. I just want you to stay there and pray. And if you have the smallest of inclinations, would you go to God with your conflict? Would you go to God with the passions that are at war within you? Would you stop avoiding him and stop resisting him, no matter how small or how big it may seem? Then as you go to God, there might be that you need to be restored 
to someone in this room, or you may need to make a phone call and be restored to them. And if so, I urge you, would you do that now instead of waiting till the perfect time? There's going to be some prayer team members in the back. It's a joy and an honor to pray with you. And so if you just need someone to pray into this with you, they'll be back there to pray with you. But first, just take a few minutes, pray where you are, listen to the Father, and don't avoid him. Holy Spirit, come and work. We are your people. In Jesus' name.